So before I cut apart hundreds of boots on YouTube to see what's on the inside of boots and shoes, I was no different than everybody else and was completely blind as to how to buy heritage traditionally made boots, what to look for, what not to buy. And so I wanted to make this video to, to show you my first pair of heritage boots, aside from like the firefighting boots and the work boots that I, that I purchased throughout my life. Uh, these, I, I kind of consider this more of like, I bought, this is the first pair of heritage style boots that I bought for a specific purpose and for casual wear and to wear when I'm not working, hunting, hiking, that kind of stuff. So this should be everything you need to know before buying your first pair of boots, everything you need to know, what price range, uh, what you should consider, what to avoid, hopefully everything you need to know to get into this fun world of heritage style, traditionally made boots and shoes. So what were my very first pair of heritage style boots? Well, they were the Chippewa Apache boots. They retailed for about 190 bucks, I think, at the time. Right now, there's an updated model for a little bit over 200 bucks. I think it's like 210. I actually have it pulled up. Benefits of having this right next to me, except for I don't have it pulled up. The 2.0 version retails for $210. So they've gone up a little bit in price, and I'm not sure what's changed. But this boot has their V1, the Vibram V100 outsole. It's got a leather upper unlined and that's why I was initially attracted to it because I drew out a tag for a really rare once in a lifetime hunt. It was a, a bull elk hunt, which said we have that big bull in the back of the shop you've probably seen. That was that hunt and it was literally once in a lifetime. It takes like 30 years to dry out. Half the tags go to people that have accumulated points for every year they put in and try to dry out that tag. Half of those go to the most, the highest point owner of the group owners of the group and then the other half of the tags just get randomly drawn to everyone that, that put in for that tag that's trying to draw that tag and that's how they generally give out deer and elk tags especially for these limited draws and these once in a lifetime hunts and i just happen to randomly draw it i think i only had like i probably had like 12 or 13 points and it takes like 30 points to draw out and so i just randomly draw drew it and so for that hunt, I wanted to make sure that I got a good pair of boots that I could rely on, something I could hike in, but I was so stinking poor at the time. I was like, well, if I'm gonna buy a pair of boots, I would like them to be able to be used in everyday life. Um, from in the winter, because at the time I was living in Logan, Utah, which is like the Arctic North of Utah. And so I, I wanted a boot that I wasn't just spending 200 bucks for nothing for a single hunt that I was barely gonna use. And that's why I decided on these boots, because it has the big luggy outsole, a nice leather upper. I, I liked the idea of a leather upper because it was a, it was a fall hunt, it wasn't winter yet, and we did a lot of scouting scouting and stuff, and so I didn't want a really hot, sweaty, stinky boot, especially when you're trying to put the stock on an elk. And I just always liked more heritage style boots. Like I said, from when I was a firefighter, I knew the value of them, I knew the, the ins and outs and why I wanted a leather boot instead of these synthetic foam-based boots, which included that stability underfoot, the breathability of a leather upper, the, the comfort of leather. Um, I like the look of them better. You get a lot more of an aggressive outsole on these more traditionally styled boots. And um, yeah, I, I just, I wanted, I, I wanted a pair ultimately. So, cause I had some other hiking boots. I just, I wanted to have a really nice boot for that hunt because it was such a unique hunt. And just to give you a quick synopsis of that hunt, we, we scouted for like two weeks straight. The hunt started and I think it was like a week and a half. And we didn't really see a good bull for the majority of the hunt until the second to last day, right before dark, we saw a giant bull and we didn't get it. And so I was really bummed out. I was like, that was our one shot. We're not gonna, probably never gonna fill this tag. It is what it is. It's once in a lifetime hunt. I, I drew it randomly. Maybe it'll come back around. The last day of the hunt, I had kind of given up hope if I was being honest. And I, I, uh, was, I was lounging on my four wheeler. It was like two o'clock in the afternoon. So most of the, the elk were bedded down or just chilling, but it was the rut, which means the elk were in heat and they're trying to mate. And all these big bulls are out trying to gather their cows together, trying to def defend from other other big bulls. And so they're out milling around at two o'clock. And I was trying to scout, you know, I was glassing a hillside, trying to find something, mostly being lazy because I didn't think we were going to get anything. And then my uncle Kyle gets on the on the radio, he's like, get over here right now. We got a bull, get over here. And I was like, where are you? I'm, I'm coming. He's like, I'm way across the, the mountain range. So I got on my four-wheeler and just ripped across the mountain range. I was going way too fast, way too dangerous. It was a once in a lifetime hunt. So I was, you know, I was going for it. And we show up, I show up there, I find Kyle. We're kind of hiking around. And was, what had happened is this singular giant bull had a, a little harem of, I don't know, like 10 cows or something, uh, cow elk, not, cow, not beef cows. Um, and he was defending against two or three other bulls that were bugling at him, trying to come up and steal his, steal his ladies, and he was defending them off, and he's on this little bit of a knoll, and uh, 
So I was like, this is a perfect opportunity. He's not gonna smell us, he's not gonna see us, he's not gonna hear us, he's preoccupied. So me and Kyle kind of snuck down through a hillside, got posted up and saw a clearing up on the hillside and was just hoping and waiting for him to come into that clearing. And I got down, rested on just kind of an upward angle shot. I think I was, I think I had a 338 Ultra Mag for you guys, gun heads. And uh, popped into that clearing, sided him up, took the shot. And I thought that uh, I missed because I, I was at such a high angle and that's such a powerful gun that it scoped me. I have a scar still on my forehead from that elk. And, I was, and my, my uh, uncle was like, oh, I think you might've missed it. I was like, I don't know, it felt like a good shot, but like, maybe you're right, let's go, let's go see what we got. And uh, so we, we walk around there and we're looking for him and all those cows that he was defending against immediately just went off and went to the other bulls. And um, we walk over there and we see him laying in the, in the little uh, scrub oak and he's dead as a doornail. And, uh, you know, he's a giant bull, huge bull, and he had broken a tine off, and he, he's, a, he's a weathered old bull. He'd passed on his genetics, and he was delicious. And uh, so that's kind of the story of how I got that giant bull in the back of the shop. It scored, I think it scored like 365. Um, and I, I can't remember if that was with the broken tine or without it, but it was a good world-class bull. I was really happy with it. And uh, I got it with these boots on. and. So they worked, is what I'm getting at, you know? And, it, and I, I really love these boots. I've kept them for that reason, but I just don't wear them as much anymore because I have higher quality boots. They're, they're not as comfortable as some of the other boots because they're a more budget friendly boot. But that's kind of the point of this video is to kind of show you guys that you don't have to buy a $600 pair of Knicks or Whites or JK for your very first boot. It's actually more beneficial to get a boot that's $250 and under for your very first boot for several reasons. One, you get to try out the heritage style without spending a ton of money. You get to figure out your sizing, you get to figure out what your style is, you get to see if you actually get to wear them, see if they're useful. And then later you can always upgrade to a higher quality boot once you've got these worn out or you just have decided that you're willing to upgrade to a higher quality boot. So, the lens of this video is going to be a $250 and under leather heritage style boot that's going to have traditionally built uh, construction style with a Goodyear welt stitched down, Blake stitch, that style of boot, and not a cemented boot. And so what do you need to look for before buying your very first heritage boot? What did I learn? What have I learned over the last few years of cutting boots and shoes in half? Well, number one would be identify what you're gonna do in them. What do you want them for? What do you? What activities are you gonna do? What, what Are they a functional boot? Are they just for dress? Are they for out on the town? Do you wanna to be a little bit more dressy? Do you wanna be more rugged? Do you want them for work and for, for casual? You know, identify what you want them for and then you'll, that'll help you narrow down your selection because it'll help you figure out what your price point is, first of all. Because if you just are getting a pair of boots to beat up at work on an occasion you're gonna wear them, uh, casually, you might want to go with a really cheap boot because if you're going to destroy them, it's a really affordable way to try out this style of boots. Um, if you're doing more dressy, you might want to go towards more of the pointy style boots like Thursdays and some of these other that are like a rugged dressy boot. If you're going full heritage, you can do more like the Chippewa. You know, there's a lot of different options. Also, what you're actually going to do in them because that'll help determine one of the more important aspects of buying your first boot, which would be your outsole. And an outsole, if you don't know, is the part of the boot that makes contact with the ground, pretty self-explanatory. So if you're doing a lot of hiking, a lot of uh, out in the rough country, you might wanna go with a really luggy boot that you need a lot of grip and traction for. If you're gonna be mostly dressing, dressing up to go to fancy stuff and do, look fancy, you might wanna go with a, sl a more slick, slim, typical like uh, half sole uh, with a heel top lift. If you're going for a really dressy look, you could look at some soles, some leather soles. Uh, if you're looking for a hybrid, look for something that's kind of in between. It's kind of self-explanatory. So it's not, I don't think we have to go over that really in depth. But the next thing to consider when buying a pair of heritage boots is the comfort because a lot of people just, for whatever reason, assume that boots are gonna be as comfortable as their sneakers and they're not going to be especially when you first get them. They take some breaking in, your, your, your instep's gonna have a little bit of pain. It's gonna be squish your toes a little bit as you, as you start wearing them in. Um, so as long as you aren't anticipating them being as comfortable as a pair of sneakers, you'll probably be okay. And, and it's not a bad idea to get your first boot with an insole in it. You know, there's a lot of these $250 and under boots come with an insole, which I think I took out already. This is gonna help you transition to this style of boot, get your feet conditioned, also just get you mentally conditioned to wearing more stiff and hard boots. Because the real heritage ones, like these $350 and up, they don't usually come with an insole, so it's a good 
it's a good way to, to ease yourself into this market. Another thing to consider with comfort is boots don't stretch as much as you think they do. A lot of people out there will say, get it tight, your, boot, your boots are gonna shape to the shape of your foot. And those people are usually wrong because they usually, their boots are too tight and they don't wanna admit it. And that's because boots don't stretch nearly as much as you think, especially in the vamp where you've got the outer layer of leather and then a lining. And leather stretches, but it's not as much as you might think. And most of the time when people feel boots stretching, all it is is that vamp, the upper part of this boot, compressing down and filling out the side of the boot because it's usually a lot taller when you first get them. So they're not stretching, it's just the leather's moving to the shape of your foot. So when I'm getting a pair of Heritage boots, what I'm looking for is no pressure on my toes. I don't want my toes squished at all. I don't mind like a, my toes touching the sidewall of the, the boot a little bit if I know I've got some room to kind of expand that out. But for the most part, I just, would err on the side of going half a size up. If you're deciding between like a nine and a nine and a half, the nine's a little snug, the nine and a half is just a little bit loose, just go with the nine and a half because it's gonna be more comfortable, it's gonna break into the shape of your foot, it's gonna conform around your foot. Worst case scenario, if it's just a little bit too big, if it doesn't come with an insole, you can throw an insole in or you can add an, an additional like thin insole in to kind of get that size up to where you need it to be because it's a lot easier to get a big boot to fit you than it is a small boot to fit you. That kind of brings us to sizing, because sizing is all over the place for heritage style boots. Um, one of the biggest mistakes people make on their first boot is buying the same size of boot that they get in their sneakers. And that's almost never the right size because for whatever reason, boots and, sh boots and shoes size completely different. Boots are usually a full size down, if not a size and a half to two size down for some people. And so, the best way to mitigate this and figure out what, what, uh, how the brand you're looking at getting sizes is to just go to a shoe store, get your Branock size, or measure your own Branock size. I'll put a link in the description of our sizing guide for various collaborations that you can kind of calculate your own Branock size. And then once you have that size, it's a standardized size, then you can go to the forums, you can go to Reddit, you can go to, uh, uh, you can contact the brands and tell them, I'm a 10 on the Branock, what should I order in your boots? Or search like, uh, boot sizing for Chippewas. And you, you'll probably be able to find a forum somewhere that gives you some general recommendations. Make sure you take plenty of people's opinions into consideration because people size things completely different based off the size of their feet. But the foolproof way to do it is just go to the store, especially if you're in the Red Wing market or some of the more work style heritage boots. You can go to like in, here in the West, we have like Boot Barn, a Sportsman's Warehouse, you got Cabela's, you got all these stores that carry this style of boot that at least have some of the brands. So you can slip your toes into one and kind of get the general sizing and go off of that. And the beautiful thing of all this is once you get your size dialed in in a cheaper pair of boots, like once you know your Chippewa size and you know your Red Wing size, when you go to invest in a higher quality boot in these like $600 to $800 price range, you're not, tr you're not starting from ground zero. You can take that size and say like, I'm a nine and a half in Chippewa. What do you guys recommend for your boots? They'll be able to base it off of their recommendation off of what you've worn previously, off that Branock size you found and uh, get you a lot closer on a very expensive pair of boots. Then once you have the boots, break in is another thing to consider because it's not gonna be fun. Most of these heritage boots have a nice thick two and a half millimeter leather-ish and it takes a while to shape to the shape of your foot. You can add some mean coil and conditioner to it to help the break in, but keep in mind it's gonna darken your boots. So try it on a small spot first before you commit to the whole boot and get mad at me for completely changing the color of your boots. But uh, the best way to do it, or maybe not the best way, but the foolproof way of doing it is just start wearing them like a couple hours at a time. First couple days, wear them around the yard, go do a couple chores in them, uh, wear them around the house in the evenings. Just start it to shape to the shape of your foot. Start getting those creases in there, start getting the, the leather, those really tight fibers, start getting them loosened up so that it'll actually shape to the shape of your foot. Because you don't want to take these on an eight mile hike or an eight hour work day on the very first time because you'll regret it, you'll get lots of blisters. So just take your time, ease into it, wear a couple pairs of socks, do whatever you need to because blisters take a lot longer to heal than they do to form. Then once you've worn them a couple times, that kind of brings us to the quick care guide. For the most part, people really over-exaggerate how much you need to care for your boots. The way that I do it, being more of the guy that likes more rugged looking stuff, I don't mind nice stuff getting beat up and dent, dented. I, I, I wear mine to work, I wear out, out on the farm, hiking, hunting, so for me, this is how I do it. If they're dirty, I just take a brush, a horsehair brush, and brush them off, they're just cheap from Amazon. I'll put a link in the description. Those little teeny dirt particles, if they get into the leather, they work as an abrasive that break down the leather and separate the grain. And so brushing them off is always a good idea if they're really dirty. 
Um, and then for conditioning, unless you're in water all the time and they're, you're really beating them up, most people are gonna get away with just conditioning at the beginning of the season and the end of the season or fall and spring, depending on, everyone's got a season, right? It depends on if you're working in these or if you're hunting in them, if you're just wearing them casually. I would just condition beginning and the end of the season and if they look like they're getting dry, condition them throughout the season. But it's hard to screw up leather because there's the, the more modern leathers have so much conditioner packed into them. Like these are still moist from me putting a bunch of mink oil on them a few years ago. And most of these leathers are chrome tan leather that are that simulate Chrome XL, which is just chock full of, of conditioners and oils that are gonna prevent this from cracking and splitting. And then the last thing is a, just a, a few things to be aware of to look out for when you're buying a pair of these. Look out for fake Goodyear welts. Just because you see a stitch around the toe and around the boot doesn't mean that it's actually sewn together. There's lots of more cheap brands that put a fake welt on it to make it look like it's more high quality and traditionally made when it's just not. It's literally just glued on and the, the outsole is glued onto the upper and you can pull them apart by hand. Um, look out for fake leather. Just read the fine print of all these listings. You know, there's a lot of tricky words like reconstituted leather, faux leather, vegan leather. If it's not leather, it's probably not leather. So just be careful with it. And look at the cross sections, make sure that it's actually the panels that you think are leather are real leather. Cause as we've seen from Nike, they'll say, oh, it's a leather shoe. And then they'll have like one little piece of leather and the rest is fake leather. Look for tricky wording in, in just the whole thing. Cause even these Chippewas, when I first bought these, the reason I got turned on to them because they, they said they were a Cordovan pair. And if you don't know, we've done a couple videos on Cordovan. It's the most expensive leather in the world. It comes from horses' butt cheeks. I'll put links to those videos in the, in the description in the cards. And they called them Cordovan, but they used the Cordovan word as a color instead of like the leather. So I bought a pair of these like, oh, I just got a pair of Cordovan boots for 200 bucks. Can you believe this? I got them I'm like, oh, these aren't, it's not Cordovan. This is just the color Cordovan. And so look, at the fine print very closely, especially in these $250 and under boots because they get tricky and they'll, they'll trick you into buying something that they hope that you're not even gonna notice. And speaking of that is, you know, just keep in mind that in these more affordable heritage style boots, you're, gonna, you're not gonna get the highest quality materials because the cross section of this Chippewa, you can see it's just fiberboard. The filler instead of like the typical cork that you see in high quality boots or leather filler is just basically carpet filler, like recycled foam. You do have a steel shank, which is good. And that's, you know, part of the reason why you want to spend more than hundred bucks on a pair of this style of boot, because you do get the vital components put into the boot and it's still built in the same way. It just uses inferior and less durable components. And then you can see it's got a layer of compressed cardboard and then the outsole. And so it's built in the same way. It's just not, it's not using the same materials. So it's still going to give you the feel of a heritage style boot, the look of a heritage style boot with a half the price of the, the really top end stuff. Now, what about some brands to consider? Well, Thursday makes some really nice rugged that rugged boots that are somewhat dressy. You can, they have some dressy style boots. They're like 200 to 250 bucks. They're made in Mexico and they're really high quality. Thoroughgood makes some good made in USA boots that are more work oriented. Their mock toes are really, really good look and they're super comfortable. They might be the most comfortable mock toe you can buy. Uh, Georgia makes some really affordable heritage style boots that are the bare minimum of what you um, should spend. Anything less than a Georgia, I would avoid because Georgia does similar to Chippewa, replaces all the leather components that you usually see in a traditional boot with more affordable components at a, a very affordable price. So you can get the look, the feel, to see if you even like it. Uh, Georgia is a really good option for this. Uh, next would be Jim Green, made in South Africa, nice wide toe box, traditionally made. It's gonna give you that harder, uh, more stable feel underneath your foot. Next is Danner. Danner, similar to Chippewa, it's just a more affordable version of a lot of the other boots like Red Wings. You just don't get the same components. Origin, all made in the United States. It's a little bit more expensive, but it feels more like a more, it's built like a high quality boot, but it feels more like a sneaker than even some of these more affordable brands. Parkhurst is a really small company that makes fairly affordable boots. Truman, it's it's more expensive, but I just thought it was worth mentioning because it's cheaper than the highest end boots, but they're built almost exactly the same. Area has tons of models you could choose from with all different styles of construction. Helm has some really good boots. Carolina is really similar to Thoroughgood. Beckett, Simonon, they're, they're a really good option that's similar to Thursday where they're more dress oriented, more classy looking. And then Chippewa, you know, Chippewa still makes some decent boots. Uh, we haven't cut apart the more modern ones, but you know, keep in mind, they're not your Red Wings. They're not, they're not these uh, higher quality boots that 
people really are, are, are trying to get. They're just a stepping stone towards those style of boots. That's everything I can think of off the top of my head that I spent the time planning, but I, the beautiful thing about these videos is the comment section is a great resource. So anything I forgot, like tips that you would recommend to new boot owners, put it in the, in the comments. Um, other brands that you'd recommend to people, put it in the comments because it's, I can only cover so much in these Roseanne 2 videos with the time I have. And it's fun because this channel is still small enough that you guys can be involved and people can come to this as a really solid resource. So put every every bit of information that you have in the comment section. It helps uh, helps the videos out too, technically, I think. I don't actually know if that's true. That's why we don't really ever have people comment. We don't like artificially ask people to comment because I'm not convinced it actually does anything. But it is a good resource. So thank you guys for watching. If you like the style video, let me know what you liked, what you didn't like. Um, because we just, you know, this Roseanne 2 is just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what, uh, seeing what sticks of, out of the things that I like covering. So let me know what you thought of this video and what other topics you want me to cover. And thank you guys so much for our, your support on Roseanne the main channel, Roseanne 2, Roseanne Builds, Roseanne.com, where we make all of our handmade leather goods here in the shop that built the expertise that helped me understand the boot world and be able to judge it at the level that I do now. It's all thanks to those handmade leather goods. So check those out. And thank you guys for all your support. See you.